Our plenary session is entitled Connecting Education to Employment in the Age of COVID-19. Here's an opportunity for a very distinguished group of thought leaders to discuss the theme of our conference. We're honored to have these extraordinary speakers, each renowned in their field, join us today at a time when wisdom is so needed. I'm pleased to introduce the moderator of this session. I welcome Chip Lindsay, the very respected education director at the very respected Children's Museum of Pittsburgh. Chip, thank you for being here and joining us. Hey, thank you, Michael. It's, a, it's such an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, truly my first time to be uh, on a stage quite like this one. Um, you know, I, I was inspired by uh, the wonderful words of, uh, of the students ahead of us. And uh, it does draw out some really fascinating um, uh, realities that we're dealing with now in the in the in the COVID world that we're in. Uh, I remember the old saw about um, you know how do we teach uh, uh, our children for jobs that they'll have when they graduate when those jobs don't exist uh, uh, in uh, yet. So we're kind of living that um, almost on a day by day basis, and uh, it's with great uh, humility that I get to introduce uh, the plenary panel. Um, uh, we've got uh, for incredible thinkers uh, and and, uh, and and folks that have worked in this realm. Uh, I, I'm going to introduce in a moment uh, Ella Norbash, uh, who's the uh, K&L Gates Professor of Ethics and Computational Thinking at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, truly a futurist, and um, has advised and worked on projects uh, for uh, organizations as diverse as uh, uh, Procter & Gamble to NASA, I mean, just all over the place. Uh, also, uh, uh, Chimpika is going to be joining us from the MIT Media Lab, uh, where as interim director of the Scratch Foundation, uh, Chimpika is part of this uh, wonderful uh, environment at uh, MIT, and Scratch is uh, truly one of those uh, incredible spaces that uh, children contribute uh, their own programming and uh, wonderful work, and uh, and has created an, uh, one of the largest networks that we. Uh, that we know there's Chempika now. Thank you. Um, and then also uh, Diane Levitt from Cornell, uh, uh, Cornell Tech, Senior Director of K-12 uh, Education. Uh, another interesting, fascinating um, uh, woman because she's uh, in the K-12 realm but has also been in corporate philanthropy and really thinking about uh, social justice and social change. So uh, pleased to have uh, Diane. And last but not least, Eileen Owens from uh, uh, from here in Pittsburgh, uh, South Fayette, Director of uh, Technology and, Edu and uh, Innovation, uh, truly a leader in that K-12 realm. So um, without further ado, I'm going to give this first question to Illa. And, uh, and uh, Illa is one of the country's uh, really leaders in, the, in thinking about the future and, and the role of education. Um, can you lead us off in your thoughts on what you're seeing uh, in the realm of learning and education? Uh, and the changing workplace, especially now in this uh, in this pandemic reality we find ourselves now. Uh, what kind of pipeline can we expect in the future? Um, and then, um, uh, and then, what will we see after this initial disruption? Uh, uh, as you, in the way that you're thinking about it. Thank you for the kind introduction, Chip, and thank you, Michael, for inviting me to be part of this. It's really an honor to follow the students who had outstanding words, and really they set the tone for the whole conference. Um, I assume that you can hear me. I don't have good feedback for that. So, Chip, if you, if you could nod, I'll know that people can hear me. All right, excellent. Uh, well, when I think about the impact that COVID is having, uh, both uh, tactically and systematically on the way we think about jobs and employment, I really uh, break it down into four categories, students, teachers, parents, and the system as a whole. And let me start with students, because this is an unprecedented time in the sense that students of all ages are suffering from the fact that their social emotional development, the very friend networks that they have to be able to build and socially integrate with, those are unable to be as fulfilling as they were before COVID. And if you think about the growth path that students have as they become our future leaders, one of the most important aspects of that growth path is developing a sense of personal confidence, personal agency. That comes from control and certainty in their environment, from understanding how the world works and their role in the rules that promulgate their, their interactions in the world. And what we have right now is a huge challenge, is that in fact, the rules have changed. What you can do has changed. How you can socially and emotionally develop has changed. And as a result, the confidence building that happens, especially in middle school and up, 
isn't something that's happening at the same scale and with the same kind of structure as it used to. I think that's one major thing we have to think about. Of course, one part of that is also sports. We don't forget that a whole ton of kids who could play basketball in the backyard with their friends, who could go to a soccer, uh, repeatedly a soccer game, and have that muscular coordination, that social control in sports, that's gone. That's evaporated. And that leaves people with a little lack of a sense of balance in their lives. So that's kind of one side we have to think about. On the teacher side, what's really interesting for teachers is the symmetry of the problem. The teachers I know have kids. So they're homeschooling their kids now, attempting to connect to asynchronous online learning at the same time that they're trying to create their own online learning experience for their students. So you have a level of empathy that the teachers have toward what's going on that is really never been seen before. And at the same time, the fact of how, especially our administration is dealing with COVID, puts a fine, sharp edge on issues of inequity, on issues uh, that actually Emilia brought up of the power hegemonic structures that we have in society. And that sharp edge, that spotlight that's shown by what's happening right now is powerful because it's a learning opportunity. It's something that you simply can't turn your, ways, your eyes away from. It's a chance for teachers to integrate what's happening now into the lessons that they're teaching to their students. And if you look at middle school and then especially high school, I'm seeing more and more teachers who are taking exactly the statistics, the reality of the demographics against what's happening right now, and they're turning that into part of the lesson for what they're teaching. That suggests that project-based learning will become even more powerful because this is an incredible chalice for seeing the ways in which real world projects, real world impact really, can directly impact the way we do learning and the way we have discourse around that in everything from social studies class to math class to computer science class. So that I think is huge. And then parents, of course. This is either a huge problem for parents because suddenly they're taxed with their children, or it's an amazing opportunity for parents to have a role of vigor in the education and engagement with their children that goes way beyond what they had before. You know, people have talked about the idea that maybe we'll go back to eating less that. So I think if we can learn to take the best of what we can from higher and richer interactions right now at home and keep that, even as we have richer social emotional development at school, that's the best thing. And the last thing I'll say before I suck up way all the time is systems level. Um, fundamentally, as we figure out hybridized models for having online learning and real learning, we know that the next couple of years are going to mean going in and out of school. It's not going to be smooth. It's going to be going to school and then, oh, there's an outbreak in my particular town, so we're back to online learning for a little while. We're going to be going back and forth. And there's going to be amazing learning opportunities and engagement opportunities online that teachers come up with around the world. The question will be, can we abstract away from this idea of just being local and have learning be something that we do both locally and globally so that we kind of hybridize ourselves? And if you think about empathy, if you think about the ability that our students will have to lead the future, if they can hybridize their learning and if they can be in a class with Ugandans at the same time as they're in a class with their local friends, then you perhaps mix the world together in a way that's what the internet was really intended for several decades ago when I saw it being born and has been steered away from completely by the exact same hegemonic negotiations of power that big corporations play, as Emilia pointed out. So maybe this takes us back to a globalization that is the kind of globalization that maybe helps our next generation solve the lasting problems we face, such as climate change and global inequity. Thank you, Chip. Yeah, uh, fantastic. Um, uh, one uh, one point I'd like to make: our little silver lining to this virtual uh, uh, virtual conference is we have this chat, uh, and all of you in the audience are able to uh, listen uh, to these uh, incredible thoughts of our panelists of our in our plenary, and respond to them. So if you have a question that comes to mind, or you have an idea that wow, you hadn't thought about that before, you'd love to know more. Uh, I, as moderator, have the great opportunity to sort of mine those thoughts coming through the chat. So I encourage you to use the chat. It's something that we hardly ever have a chance to do, but in this, uh, in this uh, a silver lining to this, uh, uh, let's, let's use it. Uh, and our second round of questions to our plenary uh, uh, panelists here will come from the audience, come from you. Uh, so take advantage of the chat. We'll be mining that for, uh, for some good stuff. Uh, to catch our uh, catch our panelists off guard with. So, uh, without further ado, I, I really would love to have a chance to uh, um, turn a question to uh, Champika Fernando uh, from the MIT Media Lab. Uh, MIT Media Lab is near and dear to my heart because uh, I, I've uh, had 
some great, wonderful experiences at that place. I remember going there and thinking this is the closest I'm ever going to get to Q's lab of James Bond, you know, where you're wandering through and all of a sudden some crazy thing inflates out of somewhere and in your mind it's just blown and you turn a quarter and something else uh, catches you off guard. It's a wonderful, uh, innovative uh, spot using digital technologies. Uh, part of your work and uh, as the work of Scratch is really to put those tools of innovation and programming and thinking in, uh, into children's hands. Um, as, as, you, uh, as you're thinking about your work and this change uh, in our landscape uh, brought about by COVID-19, what are you seeing as the opportunities moving ahead? I'm not sure I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Thank you, Chip, uh, for the introduction. And actually, one quick clarification. Um, so Scratch, uh, the the organization or the project that I work on, it actually was born up at MIT Media Lab and grew there over the last 10 years. And actually, a bit of news just in uh, at the end of last year, we officially spun out of the MIT Media Lab oh. and now we're our own uh, separate nonprofit uh, foundation. So very exciting point in time for our organization. We only were in our new space for about a month or two before we all went to working remotely, um, but we're all sort of shifting and learning. So, um, but yeah, the, the, and the MIT Media Lab and the spirit there has uh, really informed the work that we do at Scratch and some of the pedagogy of the, the, the project, um, but just, for folks who don't know or aren't familiar with Scratch, just a quick background on what, on what Scratch is. Um, it's a programming language and online community where kids can create and share and remix stories, games, animations um, with kids from all around the world. Uh, and there are millions of kids, uh, you know, who are using Scratch to create and share projects that are very sort of personally meaningful to them. And they're using this block-based programming language to do that. Um, the mission of the work that we're doing is to support all kids uh, developing as creators with technology, not just consumers. And I think, you know, um, in the the first in the opening, Brendan put it really nicely. Um, you know, when he when he mentioned that uh, alg algorithms created by a few techies are ruling the world that we're all kind of participating in. And so, what I think is part of our mission is to uh, broaden the number of people who are participating in the actual creating of those things. And that's really what Scratch is, is about. Um, and, the, and the age range of kids who are using Scratch are, you know, generally eight to 16. Um, and so I think your question to me, Chip, was just around how, you know, the current situation has been impacting our work. Um, and I want to start by just an interesting observation we saw uh, back in March when schools started closing their buildings and moving to remote learning, um, we saw a really interesting trend in our traffic to the script. Like, so Scratch is all online. There are offline versions of the editor, but kids every day come to the Scratch website to create and share. Um, and in looking at our traffic, one of the interesting things we noted is our weekday traffic really dropped, but the weekend traffic increased. Um, and so the overall traffic to Scratch also went down, just pointing out to us a how much schools are a big part of how kids access this type of um, technology. And the fact that the weekend engagement went up, I think highlighted to us the, um, the desire that kids have. To, it, it, when I say the weekend usage went up, it was also just engagement, kids creating projects, sharing projects, and then uh, connecting with, sharing with one another and communicating with one another. Um, and so I think some of the key takeaways for us from that was just A, this, you know, the fact that there was this increased engagement on the weekends and from a, from a portion of kids who were participating, um, I think highlighted this during this time, this human need for creativity and social engagement. And I think we've seen that like beyond scratch. Like if you look at other, social platforms like Facebook and TikTok and Instagram, there are adults who are being, who are tapping into their creativity in new ways. Um, and, you know, just people even thinking about like masks that people are creating, it's an opportunity to like sew and express yourself. And so there, I think during a time like this, it also really, you know, create, tapping into your creativity is a way that people are coping. And social engagement is also another really important way that 
something that kids usually get in their day-to-day -day classroom, but they're coming to scratch in the online community to, to get that. Um, the second, uh, and actually related to that, creativity is just, you know, I think for us core to what we do and beyond just being something that's really like people are really tapping into right now to deal with the situation. It's something that when we think about how our leaders in society are handling the situation, like in almost every profession, you know, we've had to be creative to think about how to deal with the situation. Like doctors are being creative, politicians are being creative, um, you know, small business owners are rethinking the way they do things. And it's really tapping into this need for creativity, which is often under emphasized in traditional education. Um, and so that's another thing that we see is just in the work that we do with Scratch, how are we building that creativity and that um, that way of thinking so that kids are set up to deal with, you know, it's, hopefully there's not a pandemic on a regular basis, but in a society where things can constantly change and there are unknowns, creative thinking is really a core part of, of how to deal with that. Um, the other, I think, big highlight for us is just something that, you know, has already come up with both, like, uh, Brendan and Emmy highlighted this, Ela highlighted this. I think just the gaps in our social and educational systems that make access to this type of education incredibly inequitable. Um, and, you know, some people have talked about this as, like, the great equalizer, but in fact, you know, as others have pointed out already, it's exacerbating those uh, existing inequalities. Um, and so one of the things we've been thinking about a lot on our team is the part, and I think it'll take many, many people to both recognize and really think about how we can address those gaps. But we've been thinking on our team, like what is the part that we can be playing here? Um, and so a lot of what we've been doing is supporting, thinking about how we're producing materials and uh, working with other organizations to support parents and educators who are now, you know, at home and trying to figure out how to engage students at this time um, and how they can be using the Scratch platform for that. Um, and then as, as Ilo pointed out, the, you know, for us, a lot of what we do is very much based on project-based learning. And the current situation really does lend itself better to project-based learning. But again, not everyone has the experience on how to sort of, how do you do project-based learning? And then how do you do it at home with kids? Um, and so a lot of what we've been thinking about is the role that we can play in scaffolding and supporting project-based learning at home. Um, and I think actually I, I will, I think I'm way over my time now maybe, so I'll, I'll stop there <laughs> and pass it back to you. Uh, you know, it's uh, what you say, Jumping, I, it makes me realize this, Plenary could go on all day. I'm pretty sure um, there's uh, there's some really wonderful things that are getting pulled out. Uh, I'll remind the uh, audience, our studio audience, uh, keep filling up the chat because uh, it'd be great to have your questions help uh, uh, populate this last uh, bit. Uh, but before we go too far, um, uh, Diane, I I'd love to ask you a couple of questions. And Champika is really drawing out some of the things that I think I'd love to hear from you because when we think about this COVID crisis and the, the shifts that it's had on society, on education, on the workplace. Um, you've been thinking about uh, equity issues and about social change uh, for many, uh, many years with a lot of different organizations. What are you seeing now as we're moving into this new reality and when we're moving uh, beyond it? What, what will that look like and what are the opportunities that you see? Thanks, Chip. Um... So it's interesting, we've been hearing from people that the virus does not discriminate. Um, and, and I actually think that's true. It doesn't discriminate, but it also does not level the playing field uh, with the virus, or rather the response to the virus does is to amplify. For me, the through line, the big truth about the pandemic is that it has taken the cracks in our social foundation and turned them into chasms. So this is especially true in education. Everything that was broken before feels more broken now. And our challenges haven't changed as much as they have grown, right? The huge disparity in school effectiveness, largely, although not exclusively tied to income, is even more visible in school's ability to respond to the very turnaround, that really quick turnaround to online instruction. 
there's been a huge variability in teachers' opportunity to prepare for this turnaround. So some districts shut down for weeks while teachers got familiar with tools here in New York City. Our teachers had four days to prepare uh, for online instruction. So the downside of that is that four days is not enough time to learn a completely new pedagogy. Um, and most teachers still don't know uh, all the affordances of the platforms they're using. The upside of the quick turnaround is that these students had a less of a chance to be out of the habit of school with its norms and conventions. Students who had several weeks off probably had some learning loss already. In large urban districts like ours, uh, students with special needs struggled to get the services to which they were entitled before this crisis. So despite heroic efforts by teachers and parents, I think these students are still um, underserved. Similarly, I'm really concerned about emerging bilingual students and whether they are able to maximize their learning in this environment. The degree to which schools were able to forge authentic, meaningful, productive partnerships with families before the pandemic is a good predictor of what's happening and how things are going right now, right? So families are much more able to step in to support education they fully understand and have been a stakeholder in. This is no time to explain your strategy for teaching math. If you haven't communicated well with parents before, this is a really hard time to start. Uh, among the other disparities that are becoming visible, none is more striking than students' access to broadband and laptops. So students who had all that in place in mid-March were able to participate from the get-go, and those who did not were not, period. Access to technology is all over the map. So we have three and four siblings sharing a single device, sometimes with working from home parents, students with no Wi-Fi or limited Wi-Fi, students who waited weeks or longer to get a device from the district, which I wanna say mounted an amazing effort to get a device in every kid's hand. If I have learned nothing else from this crisis, I've learned that I know we are serious about addressing inequities in education when every single public school student in this country has a decent laptop and free broadband access, period. As before, uh, students of color and students who live in poverty are disproportionately impacted by the challenges we're facing. And I'm really grateful to Emmy for bringing that into such, um, making that so visible to all of us right from the beginning. The health and wealth of their families and communities are disproportionately impacted while fewer high quality educational resources are being deployed, deployed in their communities. The fragile pipeline of underrepresented students into tech um, is taking a big hit. And Brandon really called attention to the disparity between access to computer science education. Some elementary and middle schools that have been teaching computer science felt they had to put it aside during the pandemic in the name of shoring up math and ELA. Inclusive curriculum is harder to deliver online and high school and college students with crucial summer internships have seen them canceled as tech companies realize they're gonna go remote over the summer. This is gonna have profound workforce impact on this generation. And we're gonna to have to carefully scaffold around these students to get them back on track. Okay, so you asked me to take out my crystal ball and look at the post-COVID school. I do think we'll see a lot of learning loss and emotional fallout for our most vulnerable students. And there are gonna be budget challenges, but I don't think the future is uh, that bleak. At Cornell Tech, we always say, we're trying to get kids to the intersection of rigor and joy. And I see lots of opportunity to do that uh, in the next few years. For one thing, all of us have been compelled to learn new ways to teach and learn. So students have taken on a lot more responsibility for their own education, and parents have had to become uh, much more closely involved in school. I don't think any of us are gonna leave those new strategies behind. I think getting back to the classroom is going to feel great, and that most teachers are gonna feel really strong and uh, have a renewed commitment to teaching. I think it's possible that for a while at least, class sizes will be dramatically smaller uh, in the name of social dis distancing, and that that will make learning recovery easier. I hope we are gonna be assessing kids very closely to figure out where they are in terms of their learning and that that will force us to personalize their education more, also a great thing. I have been awed and amazed by the way communities of educators have gotten together 
to figure out how to mitigate the impact of this crisis on students. These professional learning communities have been sharing logistical ed tech strategies, providing insights to Google and Zoom on improving their platforms, supporting one another in great pedagogical innovation, and developing and iterating curriculum on the fly. Tools like Scratch that we already knew and loved, Chempika, uh, have been an incredible vehicle for learning for expression and for content integration. Families are gonna be more active stakeholders in school and Teacher Appreciation Week is going to be awesome next year. Um, from, yeah, I, I just wanna say that I think higher ed is gonna be more disruptive than K-12 and we're gonna have some hard conversations about value and what should happen in person and what can happen online. Thanks. Wow, that, that was awesome. Uh, I think we are gonna have a, a whole new appreciation for our teachers. I've heard that already. Um, I think the uh, other thing too that you say that uh, really resonates with me is that we are looking at uh, some opportunities to really rethink pedagogy uh, and, and the way that we're approaching in the classroom. That brings me to uh, my next wonderful uh, thinker, Eileen Owens from South Fayette uh, uh, School District here. Um, and I'm going to get your title right, Director of Technology and Innovation um, at South Fayette. Uh, you've been a leader in this, uh, in this field for a, a, a great deal, of, a great bit of time, and truly uh, where the rubber meets the road in the classroom is no mystery to you. Um, uh, as you uh, think about this uh, time and this uh, crazy world that we're living in, uh, what is the future like for you when you're thinking about uh, 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 the challenges and the opportunities um, when we think about uh, project-based learning and computational thinking? First, let me say thank you. I am so grateful to be a part of this team and the schools that can network. Uh, it's been an incredible experience to be uh, working with you all. Um, I think as we've talked about, public education has historically been underfunded. So finding funding to transform education to meet the changing needs of our society has been difficult. But now in the age of COVID, the underlying inequalities are more visible and disproportionate. Schools everywhere are facing massive deficits. Each of us here today are looking for creative solutions and actionable next steps to help our communities. Here's what we're doing and what I'm imploring all of us to do together. I have three actionable items to suggest for each of us for the future. They may seem general, general, but while I'm talking about them, just think of your specific problem and how it might fit into this equation. First, we must build creative partnerships with government, universities, local foundations. These should be multifaceted partnerships. To provide you with a bit of an overview, our district is committed to raising the level of education in K-12 computer science. And we've done this by developing a vertically aligned CS theme pathway for all students. At each grade level, computational thinking is vertically aligned and goes progressively deeper and more complex through a series of graduated and interrelated projects creating deeper learning experiences, moving from block-based to text-based code. Through the support of local foundations, research institutions, university and businesses, the district has been providing outreach regionally and nationally to provide equity in education. This year, we put together a network of creative partnerships. We received a 500,000 PA Smart Advancing Grant from the PA Department of Education to build the same CS scheme pathway in eight high-need schools four rural schools, and then four urban schools. The urban schools are part of the schools that can network. The partnership included educational researchers from University of Pittsburgh, Digital Promise, and Clemson University, evaluating ways to increase equitable participation in the CS activities, particularly among girls and students of color, by focusing on collaborative problem solving. Another partnership in the same grant is with Matt's Makerspace, who added funding for makerspaces to the districts to enhance STEAM education. Professional development was provided through a separate grant in, with the support of the Grable Foundation. For the last three years, they've supported the Summer Institute where we provide outreach and CS to teachers in the region. And we leverage this for this particular grant. Though our project could have come to an abrupt end with recent school closures, we've pivoted and we're offering the Summer Institute virtually this year. Blended learning experiences will be necessary for our future. 
By March of this year, each school had put in place a CS pathway and we impacted 4,800 students. We must all, all of us, be creative in generating these partnerships as we continue to look for support for the coming years. Next, it is critical that if we are to overcome inequality, we must share social capital to build stronger networks. As you can see, we extended the existing relationships we had in place to our partner schools. We can strengthen schools by sharing these partnerships. An example of sharing networks is that we were recently awarded a three-year NSF grant to develop K-8 coding pathway for schools in Eastern Kentucky. This grant lies at the intersection of education and an economic redevelopment program for communities in Kentucky, a disrupted economy that has lost the coal industry, which has sustained families for generations. We are using our existing network a network that has been built on the strength of Pittsburgh's strong technology sector and economy to help reimagine schools to prepare students in Kentucky for the global economy. We must all find opportunities to extend our networks for the benefit of all communities. And finally, we must build on our strength and share expertise. We took our strength, which is developing and providing professional development and CS Dean, and we've provided the curriculum for free for every district. Our lessons are aligned to computational thinking competencies and practices and focuses on student agency. To give you an example of the way in which we share expertise, data scientists from the Create Lab at CMU are helping us strengthen our new high school data science course and to build data science in all curriculum areas, grades three through 12, which we are extending through our network uh, through the Summer Institute. The lessons we use in Scratch programming the foundation of our pathway, and App Invent are both from MIT Media Lab, are embedded and shared through the pathway and in the Summer Institute to the region. We're able to bring experts from industry and university to build our programs and then to share with others. So you can see that the future for us is to pivot into a blended model, to continue to build creative partnerships, to share social capital and expertise, and to build upon our strengths while we venture into new innovative and uncharted territory. My hope is that we can grow these networks for all children together. And uh, in the links today, you'll find uh, an invitation to join the Summer Institute, again, which is virtual and free for all, free to all this year. And also um, to share the lessons we've already built, you'll find a link to the website where those lessons are held. So um, thank you for this chance to talk. Problem with uh, hitting mute is that you can never find the unmute button. Um, thank you, Eileen. This is awesome. Um, a lot of good questions are coming out of our uh, out of the chat, um, and there's one that uh, is particularly good that I, I want to sort of uh, queue up here and, and then see if somebody wants to jump in on it. And it revolved around uh, the habit of school. And to me, the um, this sort of can can go in a number of different ways. But if we look at what is our habit of school in the next decade, and what are the changes that we see, particularly uh, when we when we have to realize that the digital realm is uh, is is uh, is burgeoning, and we're figuring out how to make this work. So, if if we think about uh, the habit of school, um, and I have to tell this story, um, I had a professor who said, you know. We have a hard time with the institution of school because it's so fossilized in our understanding. He said, look at like all of the great science fiction movies, Star Trek, Star Wars, they can replicate food, they can travel at the speed of light. But when they bring up the idea of school, it's still a teacher in front of rows of six students by five students. But we just can't even imagine what school could be. Right now, we have an opportunity to reimagine it. And I think we're doing it. Uh, so as you think about that, uh, what do you think about the habit of school? And I'll let anybody jump in that wants to go. Yella. Hi, I think it's a wonderful question. And I'll tell you a personal story. Um, I was hoping that my daughter who's in high school would be able to do some investigative journalism work over the summer because we have this other problem, which is the habit of summer. We have this weird chasm between school years. And so you're always flipping back and forth between what are they gonna do this summer? How does that provide them with pathways and, and and interaction and, and exploration. And somewhere along the way, she and I were talking right after COVID started and realized, wait, your day is now completely fragmented. Your day is not away at school. It's in my house at school, fragmented with lots of free times in the middle. 
why don't we email the journalism uh, group that we were talking to and see if they just want you to do your internship at the same time. So we started doing it. And what I found absolutely fascinating was that she's now doing an internship, doing work, essentially, in a workplace, doing research, and is at school. And you know what? Because of the situation we have now, you can do it at the same time. And it's kind of like project-based learning. It's like internship. It's like mentorship. And it, it light bulb goes off immediately because I can imagine this for all kinds of different age ranges. It proposes this situation that instead of a structured school program, you have some structure and then you have some exploration where the exploration can happen during the day because we actually have so much more unstructured time during the day because of online learning and the way it works. So I got really excited about that. And I'm looking for the same kind of opportunity for my son who's in middle school now. But I think this is something we can think about. What if school becomes a way that you create skills that you sharpen simultaneously by engaging with real communities and real people. You know, many, many years ago, we abolished child labor because child labor was this horrible way of, in fact, taking advantage of children for the profit of a company. But we should kind of rethink the idea of child internship and child investigation. And of course, we don't want exploitation, but we want quite the opposite, which is to set children up to see the direct impact school learning has on skills that they can use today and because the world is online in an odd way right now, children have just as much access to the work world as they do to the school world. And this simply wasn't true until this happened to hit. So I think there's a really interesting hybrid, hybrid idea there behind between business and, and school that it's worth thinking about as well. I also want to say that I think anyone who's teaching synchronously now is uh, seeing this kind of merge between the habits of school and the habits of home. So, you know, we're teaching a lot of kids in their pajamas. That's cool. We're, a lot of us are wearing our pajamas while we're teaching. Uh, you know, just saying. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we see kids sort of lying down or lounging, letting their bodies be much more comfortable than we let them be when we're teaching them in school. It's a really interesting uh, learning experience for me to see what it's like for children when they try to hold the context of school in the context of home. I think there's a lot of schema um, crisis for kids uh, around this and that we have not done necessarily in our haste to get this all happening, the best job of trying to understand that and support it. Thank you, Diane. Anybody else wanna jump in? I would just say that uh, we struggle with that in our K-12 environment. Is so we're, we're looking at first um, identifying the competency, skills, and dispositions it takes for our students to be successful in the future of work. And then we're trying to build these pathways that allow our students to find their path and exploration along the way. Uh, we can play at the peripheral areas because of our, our traditional education system is so structured, it's hard to break out of that mold. But we are moving towards um, trying to get our students placed in internships. So if you were in the CS pathway, by the time you hit your junior year, we're trying to place you in internships, sometimes sophomore and junior years, when you've got the skills you need, we're trying to place them in summer internships um, and then take them to the next level by having a capstone project their senior year but you know, starting to merge the worlds of school and work and research. And um, I think that that is an ever present uh, uh, challenge uh, because we can't break completely out of the mold because of what's happening and the requirements of higher education for our children. But uh, we are trying to break some of the patterns by uh, in the future having uh, students, let's say, end school um, uh, some, almost a half semester early and go right into uh, passion projects where teachers and students together develop a project uh, of their interest, area of interest for let's say a four week period. So we're playing with those things and trying to make them happen. But again, the real truth is we've got to create those pathways of opportunity for our students that extend beyond our walls. I think one thing I would add just on that, that or sorry, Chip, were you gonna? No, 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 no. Keep going. Uh, just on the habit of school, I think it made me reflect also just on our the traffic stats that we saw in Scratch, where just the usage overall dropped. And 
even though I think from our perspective on the Scratch side, there are a lot of ways in which Scratch gets used in a classroom that is not in line with project-based learning and kind of takes away with, takes away from some of the goals we have around developing students as creative thinkers. But the part, the habit of school, the part that it does play is just, it's a place where kids get introduced to this technology. And I think in the past, when we started Scratch, a lot of the way it got introduced was at home by a parent who was a very sort of engaged and like had the network and connections and knew of Scratch and had the time to sort of engage their kids. And so now with kids spending more time at home, a lot of the kids who are like making the most of Scratch are the ones who have the parents who have the time and the capacity to engage them in this way. And, and so a lot of what we're doing is just thinking about with the void of the habit of school um, how are we supporting educators and parents in playing this role? Um, and then also thinking about how, sh how we can take the opportunity to shift that model towards more of the passion projects and project-based learning, because we do see that kids who get involved with Scratch that way are the ones who persist and keep coming back and are the ones who are spending all this time there on the weekends and, and really making the most of it. Uh, thank you all. Uh, it's, such a, it's such a great joy to be able to throw out um, a, a question and then have such incredible perspectives given. Um, one of the things that I'm curious about, uh, uh, too, in that habit of uh, school is that a lot of the things that, um, uh, that uh, uh, are as typical classroom practice, like how do you classroom management, how does that happen when it's online or you're on a Zoom situation? It, it all just kind of goes out the window, right? Um, I, I was talking to an educator who was working with uh, young ones uh, like uh, K and one, and and they were all really good about hitting the mute button, but then they wanted to show us their house and running through. I mean, it was uh, fantastic and and terrifying all at the same time. Um, but uh, the the notion um, that that uh, the model of scratch or the model of project based learning is that we realize uh, now perhaps more than ever that uh, learning is uh, a matter of choice. Uh, you can choose to attend uh, to your lessons in the classroom, and now you really have choice as a student to choose to attend to these virtual environments, whatever they are. Uh, it's it's a free choice uh, realm that we work in now in education, at least for the time being. Um, and and the shifts that will happen will be interesting to see how geography plays in, because now uh, space uh, dissolves. You can uh, engage with uh, students or teachers in other counties or other countries. Um, have you seen evidence of that uh, and, um, and interesting applications of that or maybe ideas about how we could use that in the future of dissolving um, uh, boundaries and borders and, and the walls of our schools? Well, um... Right now, I mean, if you're talking about like boundaries, uh, we've been for the last four years involved in an IC4 NSF grant where our students work with other maker teams from Namibia, from Kenya, from Finland, from all over different places. And their job is to co-create, to, to ask a problem, co-create and design a solution. And so we can see that those are the type of experiences we can build more readily now into our online classrooms as they start to exist. But I think the most important thing that we need to do as we move into the online world, we really have to work hard to build student curiosity and student engagement and student passion because that's where the real learning takes place. No matter where you are geographically, how can we teach curiosity again? How can we reinstill it? Because sometimes when you get into a school, you're used to one answer, one solution, because that's a traditional model. What we're really trying to do now is to find strategies to embed the art of instilling curiosity in our students. I just want to say we uh, have tried to bring project-based learning into children's homes through computational thinking and design thinking by doing some making uh, sort of virtually. Um, one of the biggest challenges we face obviously is materials and you can't assume really anything about what students have in their homes. You just can't and it's not fair to, uh, you know, first of all, we can't shop. Second of all, we have what we have um, and resources that we might have been um, 
you know, more careless about are now very precious. So we're not, uh, we're, we've had to be really careful. Um, but it has still been amazing what you can do even just with paper and cardboard from your cereal box. And uh, we are actually gonna do a big mailing um, this week of some materials for a final project to students so that we, uh, we can beef up what they've got at home. It, it is doable, but it definitely requires a lot of planning and a lot of compassion. My favorite book right now to help, you know, kind of support that uh, idea is called Dear Data. Students don't need um, more than a pencil and paper at home in their imagination to learn data analytics, to um, learn to create categories for uh, their data, and then to uh, learn ways to express it. And we're using things like um, wireframes, paper and pencil wireframes, give them the thought process and let them have the imagination to create their own app on paper and to understand the flow and the process and what each screen should look like. So it's really the human-centered design thinking skills that we can do with or without high ends of technology. And then the other thing we've been working on um, in Kentucky, uh, the problem with their uh, area is that they have a lack of internet connectivity in their home. So BitSource, the company, one of the companies we're working with just bought some radio and television stations. So what we're really trying to do now is take some of these CS team le lessons, put them on television, and then have students respond uh, through their phone with the solutions that they came up with so they can be featured on television. They can be a featured speaker. Um, in some cases, they're able to do that versus have access to internet. So we're working on kinds of different solutions for that problem. One of the things we did uh, as soon as things shut down was to start to tweet out for teachers and parents offline computational thinking resources. We're doing it at an account called uh, Breakfast CS, Breakfast underscore CS. I'll put it in the chat. But exactly. And so I'm going to look, um, maybe Eileen, you'll share those with me because I'd love to share them widely. Thank you. Um, I, I was just uh, perusing the chat. Uh, there's there's a lot of energy around uh, uh, student agency and uh, how it is that you create that or create the environment uh, necessary for that. Um, I know that we've got uh, four incredible thinkers on student agency and how it is that you uh, that you provide that opportunity for them to engage authentically in things they really deeply care about. Um, it's not easy, uh, and it's probably not um, it's probably not as simple as opening up the curriculum guide and finding those uh, those prompts, those provocations to uh, to learn and find yourself as a learner in situations. Anybody have some thoughts on best practice that you've seen, or things that really work, or the necessary and sufficient conditions for those kinds of of engagement opportunities. Can I give an example? Just a fun example. Yeah. Um, this was done by a wonderful uh, artist who is an artist in residence at the Create Lab and worked with a with a school uh, in our area. It was called Lemonade Stand, and it's an example of the really nails down agency. First of all, the kids started by learning how to use a uh, con conductive total dissolved conductive solids meter to measure the quality of water. Then they and their friends started doing this to the water at their homes throughout various regions of Pittsburgh. Then they learned how to read a map and see which are the wealthy and which are the poorer parts of Pittsburgh. Then they designed a lemonade stand, except instead of a regular lemonade stand with one big jug of lemonade that you sell lemon, lemonade through, it had 10 different jugs of lemonade. And they made the 10 different jugs of lemonade. They researched online the best lemonade recipe they could possibly find but they made each jug with water from a different neighborhood in Pittsburgh. And they made a graph that charted the water quality in each neighborhood. Then they priced the lemonade inverse to the water quality. So the highest quality water, it was a $3 cup of lemonade. The lowest quality water, it was a 10 cent cup of lemonade. Then they published the names of the uh, areas in Pittsburgh that had bad water and good water. Then they put this whole thing up in the, uh, uh, in the public square in Pittsburgh. And what happened was, parents would walk along and they'd say, would you like some lemonade? And they'd lure the kid, the parents in with this innocent looking lemonade stand. And then these third graders would lecture their parents on water inequities in Pittsburgh, how they tested the water, show them the graph and challenge them with the question, which lemonade do you want to drink? That is a project that has art. It has data understanding. 
It has learning how to use electronic tools. It has inquiry and research. But then it has a creative component that leads directly to not just building a narrative, but doing advocacy, having the goal of changing people's minds. Mm -hmm. When a child goes through that process, and you can design a project like that for every age, and we have dozens of other examples like that. At the end of that process, they have a sense of self-worth and self-power where they believe they can lecture adults and teach adults and change the behavior of adults. And that power is to me, that's agency. Um, so that's an example, but it's the kind of example that I just love to, to tell because uh, you're reprogramming the power relationship in society. You're renegotiating the power structures that are baked into society. And we can teach our teachers to walk that walk with kids. And I think that's really powerful. Uh, one of the things that comes to my mind um, and uh, it, it, uh, it weighs on me because I think uh, that a lot of the essential workers that we rely on right now, the ones who, uh, uh, who are making this society run right now are often some of the uh, least paid folks uh, in our society. Um, and, and when we think about how it is that the educational system, that pipeline supports it, I think the more agency um, that our learners have, um, the more that we can help uh, rectify some of these really uh, uh, huge inequities in our society right now that uh, that threaten to tear us apart. Um, so uh, I love the idea of uh, how it is that we uh, redefine the power structures uh, in place and allow um, all our learners to have that chance to express themselves and find their um, find their voice. Um, We've only got about uh, 10 more minutes before the end, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of good energy in the chat. But uh, I wanted to give uh, the, the rest of our panel a chance to talk a little bit about that notion of agency and, and creating that environment, either online or in the classroom, uh, where you can really see uh, students uh, uh, finding themselves and finding their voice. Actually, when the question of agency always makes me think of um... Karen Brennan, who started uh, Scratch Ed, that sort of educator network around Scratch, uh, wrote her, her thesis was around structure and agency. And I think sometimes, and I think maybe there was a comment um, in the chat about this, just the fact that agency actually requires more support, like developing agency uh, in kids requires more support and structure than like rote learning because rote learning you can kind of generalize and like there's a right answer and a wrong answer but with agency it's you know you need to think about individual learners and it's just you know acknowledging that it is you know the, the educator needs more support in how to sort of set that up and then it requires just more time more structure more support um and that's something that on our team we we think a lot about is just like what are the structures that we should be putting in place to develop that agency. Um, and in our online, like our online community, that's like a, uh, you know, a learning environment that's outside of school. Um, you know, we do a lot in there to develop these prompts for kids, like uh, as, as sort of a stepping stone to, you know, like sometimes in, in school, you'll get an assignment that's very, you know, every student is gonna have the same, there's a right answer, wrong answer. Um, in the Scratch Online community, a lot of what we've been doing for, we've had this Scratch at Home initiative that's essentially, uh, we're creating prompts for kids to do projects while they're at home. And a lot of the design of the prompts is around sparking sort of an idea that can be very customized and personalized and will sort of allow a kid to go down a path. Um, but, but what we're doing is just sort of like setting up the structure uh, to begin that exploration. And um, regarding student agency, um, again, the lessons we design now always embed the opportunity for student agency because we felt that was the missing piece in a traditional education. How do you allow students to have their personal voice? So, uh, for instance, uh, um, Tori Lojek and Sam Edkins are teaching uh, kids in three, four, and five. First, they have to get their, their uh, robot driver's license. We call it their autonomous driver's license and they have to learn to, to go through an obstacle course, but then they get to create their own obstacle course and they get to create their own parameters. And then in every lesson, whatever they choose, um, we give them the foundations of what they're learning, but they get to choose the way in which they learn it. So again, you're welcome to access the uh, lessons online and help yourself to that. 
we call this kind of agency computational agency, right? This is taking these computational tools and owning them for ourselves to create meaningful work that comes from inside us. That's the purpose of these tools in my mind and, and of this education. Uh, I, I want to point out one other area that uh, has gotten some chat uh, traction, and that's uh, thinking about urban and rural disconnect, that uh, a lot of times the, uh, the, the rural areas of, uh, of, uh, and those populations have least access to broadband uh, bandwidth and um, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, wonderful resources that uh, urban areas have that's actually very similar to uh, urban underserved. But any thoughts about that, uh, particularly with you, Diane, because you, you're thinking about um, societal change quite a bit. Can I put you on the spot? And do you have any thoughts about the uh, urban and rural um, nature of, of learning in this, uh, in this time? Yeah, uh, it's, I definitely think that um, not in the same way, but our rural students are challenged um, and left behind in a lot of the same ways that our um, urban students who live in poverty are. So access to broadband, also terrible. Sometimes no access to cell service in rural areas either, which is a double whammy. Um, and then, you know, things like internships and apprenticeships and, and you know, visits to uh, the workplace can be super challenging in rural areas. I will say that rural educators and, um, and in particular 4-H and some of the other national organizations, Scratch 2, have really been purposeful about bringing distance learning to rural areas way ahead of uh, how we've been thinking about it in urban areas. So in some ways, those pathways are laid it's just that the access can be super, super challenging. It's interesting in Cornell, we uh, in Ithaca, I'm on the New York City campus, but in Ithaca, we face sort of both challenges, right? So Ithaca City is right there uh, at Cornell, but there are districts, you know, within a 20 minute drive of Cornell that don't have cell service and that are deeply, deeply meaningful. So uh, I, I think you're right to highlight it and for us to understand that there's just some basic pipe challenges uh, in the rural communities that we need to solve. And I think what we're learning working with rural and urban schools is that our rural schools are usually uh, lacking social capital and uh, they're lacking the existing network. So for instance, BitSource, it's a group of miners who turned into software engineers and they're trying to build the technology, but they don't have a technology um, you know, economy. So they have to go to California and they have to go everywhere to try to bring jobs to them because they don't have the networks. They've only ever worked in coal. And so as what we can all do is to share our networks again and to help try to funnel and build that social capital that they've lacked. And so that's what we're finding a lot, that the rural schools haven't had that advantage. And so we, it's our job, really, our responsibility to try to lend those for them and to do it without devastating their communities, right? It's a, it's a, it's, an, it's really, that's, that's the biggest challenge is just in the same way that we're trying to remember as educators to value uh, our students' cultural uh, identity. And um, we're gonna hear uh, later on in the conference from my colleague, Christy Crawford at the Department of Education, who's done amazing work in thinking about culturally responsive curriculum in computing but we, we want to value who these students are and the capital they have, which some of it is is very hyper-local, but also find ways to bring resources to them. I totally agree with you, Amy. I'm struck by, I uh, had an opportunity to work on a project where we were working on uh, uh, creating maker spaces in, uh, in uh, community areas. and. In West Virginia, and the farther we got into West Virginia, the more we realized, oh, they should be teaching us about making because that's called life. Um, and uh, we learned a great deal. Uh, so our rural communities have an incredible uh, wealth of project-based learning that happens every day. Um, it's called life. Um, we have just a couple of minutes uh, left, and I wanted to say thank you uh, deeply and sincerely to these wonderful panelists and 
to a very engaged uh, audience with great questions that came out of the chat. Uh, truly been an honor for me to be able to uh, be on this panel and to uh, somehow play host to all these great thoughts. So uh, thank you all very, very much. And I'll turn it back over to our, uh, to our folks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.